This episode of Finding Demo Surf Fishing is being brought to you by Ninja Tackle. NinjaTackleVA.com is the website. You got to go take a look at it, man. Lots of good stuff there. I don't know. Something about rods. Something about those rods. Right now, uh, the, the hot one that's been getting talked a lot about, the Little Bummy. Yeah. The old Bama Beach Bum's Littler Rod. Yeah, it's a nine-footer. It's really good. It's been doing a lot of good things. People are having a lot of great things to say about it. You guys know I love my Dagger Series rods all the way from the seven-footer up to the twelve. There will be a bigger one coming soon. Stay tuned if you like something longer. You need rigs, tackle. He's got it all in there. Bait, absolutely. Reels, other company, they're in there. So you'll have to go take a look. If you're in a firearm or firearm accessories, ninja tactical side, optics, uh, other pieces for your Glock accessories and other stuff like that. You really can't go wrong. NinjaTackleVA.com. Go take a look. What is up, everyone? I hope you're doing well wherever you are. The fishing has been phenomenal, and you are just nailing that list that you have that you're chasing. It's always the best part, right? We're always chasing that one. Dinner is one thing, but getting that big one, that's the key. Speaking of the big ones, yeah, we're talking to the local team here. Now, you, <clears throat> if you haven't heard of a company, I don't know. Yeah, yeah we'll call it company. If you haven't heard of Coastal Worldwide, you're missing out. Now, it. It's not just sharks. That's the thing that I've I got to get out of the way. It's not just sharks. If you go take a look at their channel, there is so much more. We're talking offshore. We're talking the surf. We're talking inshore. We're talking travel. There is a ton of great content that both Dylan and Blaine are knocking out. It's, dare I say, getting better and better with every episode that they drop. They also have their own show. They also have a podcast going as well that is really really fun to watch i'll admit that i very much so enjoy it so go back and take a look at that so we're gonna stay in florida we're gonna talk with coastal worldwide here and without further ado let's get him on the show welcome to the show dylan nice to hello, see you hello hello good to and see you then, as well my friend you're looking all good and happy today i'm loving it <laughs> cheery cheery in the morning <laughs> and welcome to the show blaine what's up demo oh man look at your youthful energy you got so much energy. <laughs> one of the things i love about you dude people are like man how's blaine got him like he's got that youth power man he's got that yep. strength he's got that soul it is youth but it's also backed by caffeine a lot so <laughs> <laughs> man i i get it that's that's the way to be and sometimes that's just how it's gonna have to be yes <laughs> All right, guys. So we're going to kind of play it out here. Like we, uh, when it comes to a double like this, we're going to do onesie twosie. So, however, you guys want to answer, you're absolutely welcome to. But we're going to start way back. We're going to go back to the beginning, rewind it back. I know, Blaine, it wasn't long ago for you. <laughs> oh, man. All right. So, uh, Dylan, you lead us off on this one and then we'll continue on through. Tell us yeah. your story and what got you into fishing. Oh, gosh. I was, it's real simple. Three, four years old. Um, Papa's Pond behind the house there's like one stump of a tree you'd stand there and catch all the bluegill you ever want in your life and uh you know two or three days of doing that a couple weekends of doing that by i was five or six it was like hey these bluegill are cool and i'm addicted to it but what's next and it was like bass oh cool catfish oh cool and it was just for some reason it's always been this like climb the ladder thing and you know fast forward to here and we're, we're doing what we're doing so okay good progression blaine what about you uh pretty similarly when i was probably four or five just getting out on the little john boat in the, the lake at the house with my dad and just going to flip against the bank and stuff typically he'd be flipping and then when he hook up he'd hand me the rod since i was so young but progressively got more skillful and skillful with the rod and reel and started progressing with my own fishing ventures and eventually that progression led us to here where what I still hook Blaine's fish. Oh. <laughs> had to say it. Had to say it. Just had to it. Say it. <laughs> What's your favorite thing about fishing? Uh, I don't. 
I don't I don't know if you can have necessarily a favorite thing. There are highlights for sure, like that. Uh, is, is, at least on the shark side, on on the run, like getting that first run after you get all the baits set. Just that you hear that clicker start, just kind of rolling off the reel, and everything is just chaos in your mind for a second, and then you go through the checklist of what you need to do before you start reeling in that fish. That noise is very adrenaline pumping. <laughs> it is. It is very adrenaline pumping. Just being a just being a bystander when I was out there with you guys and I heard it once, I was like, oh, you want to reel? No, no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that stuff is always fun to watch. All right, Dylan, what about you? Yeah, I mean, I think I think Blaine hit it. Uh, I think you just stretch it across everything we do. Um, it's like the first knockdown, the first shark drag take, the first tuna to blow up. It's like you go out and the things we do, we put ourselves around big game fish for the most part, whether it's shark, swordfish, marlin, tuna, travel fishing for bluefin, that kind of stuff. And it's like you get out there with these expectations. And as soon as they're like kind of met, that reel's blowing up. It's just like that feeling is like it, it's unreplaceable, un undescribable somewhat. So that's what we do. That's why we do it, too. You start talking about real blow up and my brain went right to the boat shot when that. uh Oh, that reel well. failed and cheered on you. Help! Help! I was like, "What?" Mm. He doesn't call wrong that. type of wrong that, type of blow up, dude. That you guys worked really well through that. I mean, granted, a one in a million accident happened there, and it's not a common. But yeah, you guys handled that well. It's like, okay, hold up. You know, the initial panic. All right, what do we got here? Assess, fix, and it all worked out. Yeah, the fact that we got that fish to pinwheels from the boat after fighting it for you know, an hour. And then we finished out the last 30 minutes with, you know, having to have somebody hold the reel. And I was actually just, you couldn't use the handle anymore because it would wobble the reel because someone was holding it. So we had to just like pump up and then turn like manually turn online. It was, uh, we actually surprisingly have a lot of people that like stop and see us at like beach bum outdoors or like out in public. And they'll be like, Hey dude, that tuna video was nuts. And I, I think it's funny to like, listen to people like what, you know, in my mind, there's a lot of stereotypes of like, everyone sees the great white and they're just like, Hey, you guys got that great white, you know, like that. And like, it's like, so as many people bring up that tuna video, I'm just like, that's surprising that it like imprints people's minds. But yeah, that was a trip to forget, but we'll never forget it. So. For me, the imprinting though, was your guys teamwork. It's just, I know you two. I've known you two personally. I've seen you guys work together. You, you guys are a great dynamic. You both know what to do. You know, you know borderline know what the other one is thinking. <laughs> But it was the, <laughs> Actually, sheer, the, the sheer moment of, hey, I have a problem. Blaine's right there. Oh, okay, what are we going to do to fix this problem? There was no bickering, bitching, anything of that nature. It was, all right, let's finish this up together. How do we do it? Problem solved. And you guys got it done. That that was what always stuck out to me from that video. Yeah, no, it was, it was, I think it's the funniest part is like someone watching, like you're scrolling through your Facebook and you stop and the first cut, you hear that video is help, help, help. Comes are like, oh my gosh, this guy. Is so, but like I knew the only way to get direct Blaine's attention with urgency, with as little words as possible was help, help, help. And Blaine would know, okay, Dylan's not going to ask for help ever unless it's like necessary. So there's like this unspoken communication between Blaine and I to where, I can get through all these words and just a few because he knows, all right, Dylan's going to handle himself. But if he can't, he's going to ask for help. And if Dylan's asking for help, I best get there right now. And then he did. And so we're like, yeah, and like you're right. The bickering could have easily started. But we've with the, the crew dynamic that we bring on the boat outside of even Blaine and myself is there's a, you know, don't get your butt on your shoulders on the boat. If if Blaine was doing something that I didn't think was right, holding the reel, I was like, hey, look, do this. And he's like, do this and then do this. And then afterwards you can talk it out. But in the moment, don't waste one second because it could be one second touching the line of the gunnel, pop, there goes the fish. And then now you're working out all the details you should have done. Keep your mouth shut, be efficient. And uh, yeah, the crew's fun. The crew's crazy. We just had a crazy experience on a swordfish. And the only reason we landed it was that exact reason. Tight crew, nobody's bickering. So neat. It's Good stuff, guys. That's <clears throat> the dynamic of a team. I mean, that that's what matters the most. If you can get it right, the teamwork makes it all dream work. Yeah, that's right, baby. That's yeah, right. That's, that's absolutely true. All right, Blaine, kicking this one to you. Where's a dream place? Because you guys travel, so this is going to be a tough one. <laughs> uh, where is a dream place you guys want to fish? Oh, um, uh, we've talked about Aussie a lot, and then we've also 
um, Okinawa has a lot of dogtooth tuna that can be caught land based. And that's something on my personal bucket list is dogtooth tuna on artificial. Either it's the jig or popper, preferably the popper, but I'll take either. Um, yeah, it, it will probably be the jig and it will probably be in Fiji most likely is where the bigger ones tend to tend to be caught on um, artificial stuff. But anywhere that has a multitude of dogtooth tuna is somewhere that I want to be. Why the dog tooth tuna though? Now you got my attention. It's uh, it's this uh, it's the tuna species in general is something that me and Dylan both kind of have an obsession for, and dog tooth is just one of those on the list, and it's one of the bigger species as well. So, okay, Dylan. Yeah, so I'll I'll piggyback on playing a little bit, but uh, touch on the Fiji thing. That's something obviously we're constantly in collaboration with each other day to day talking about these travel things, but to, to skew off a little bit, it's kind of weird. Um, I'd say dream location and a dream thing to do is something we've actually already done. I just didn't do it proper in my mind, uh, was Massachusetts. So um, we're actually gonna go back to Massachusetts during kill season this year. Um, and we are going to most likely stay for enough days to get our shot, whether it happens or not, uh, but it's gonna be a bluefin on jig or popper on spin. And it's probably gonna hopefully be the 500 pound cl plus range. But we scraped through Massachusetts. We did a thing. Um, we fished with a couple of people and it was like it was over and done so quick. Now we're looking back and we're going like, OK, when we go back, this is like this is how you maximize Massachusetts without doing, you know, of course, you could land a giant tuna on a 130. So how can we make it harder for no reason? I guess that's yeah. Right. You mean your <laughs> standard <laughs> method right there. <laughs> it's, it's always yeah, yeah. you guys are always Art up for the challenge. That's artificial, neat. baby. Yeah. <laughs> And, and that's something I think it's overlooked. I really do. Cause you're right. I mean, you can land a fish on a rod and reel set like, hold on, hold my beer. Watch this. You can do that all yeah. day, but giving yourself the challenge, but also the safely set up. You know, I mean, you're not going out there for a 500 pound tuna with a runt rod. You mean, you're right, out right. there doing it, giving like, okay, cool. This is going to be an even 50, 50 match. I don't have an advantage. You don't have an advantage. We're going to fight. And let's, yeah, let's duke it out. Yeah. And mm -hmm. it's important to note, like the tuna video is something a lot of people have seen and that fish would have never, ever happened. It's one of the first tr few trips where we went out and we said, we're not bringing live bait out to the tuna grounds, which is a weird thing for people. And I think in the next four or five years, you'll see a lot more tuna fishing boats leaving with zero live bait um, because you can be more efficient in a different way. If you get out there, you start live chumming, you put two, three, four rods in the water. You're fishing for these tuna coming around the boat and all of a sudden you look 100 yards over there and there's tuna blowing up but they stay for 20 30 45 seconds by the time you clear your lines you go running they're gone so it doesn't matter we were completely athletic is what i would call our boat was athletic so we were sitting with lures watching 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 stuff started kicking off a little bit dom and i were marking fish before that fish came up we were on one side of the rig saw a couple of yellowfin jump and we saw what we thought out of the corner of our eye was a freaking literal dolphin. That was a dolphin explosion. So we were like, let's go check it out. We turned, we throw, hit popper hits the water, 200 pound plus yellowfin tuna comes out of the water. Doesn't happen if we're setting up live bait on the first blow ups we saw. So yeah, artificial is like, yeah, Spencer is someone, man, that will probably duke us out on this conversation. He's a set bait, go catch the fish. Why are you throwing lures type of guy? And it's like, there's one thing to make it harder for yourself, but there's another thing to where it, it can be an advantage at points when you're trying to be athletic and moving. But Spencer's also not a boat guy. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, he's his his worldwide travels and all the stuff, his list. I mean, that was that was something um, I did not expect when he started talking. About, I'm like, what, what are you talking about? A list of fish and then the whole thing through IGFA. I was like, OK, you are way above my level of understanding here and listening to it. <sighs> that, I mean, there's there's goal setting and then there's that. It's yeah, it's hard to get talk to Spencer sometimes like that because he's in a educational background. So he's also this incredibly intelligent person. So he'll start explaining things that seem simple to you, like simple to himself. But even I or Dylan or anybody that he talks to outside of himself are just like, what are you what, what are you <laughs> talking about? <laughs> I, don't, I don't understand. Yes. Yeah, I could see that. The scientist in him comes out with, I, I could see that. The very much so the educator and, and just the, the, the student helping. I could see that. Yeah. 
Yep. yep. Yeah, we're fortunate to be around him. Definitely uh, push this as angler. So. Oh. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Easily. Yes. All right. Here we go. Last one in this category. Then we're going to get into the fun stuff here. Uh, Dylan, we'll kick it to you first. Can you share a memorable surfish? Or I'm sorry, a memorable fishing st uh, story. I mean, you've got a lot, but anything that sticks right out in the top of your head, including unexpected catches or challenging fishing situations. Oh, goodness. Um, I've got to say it's probably um, as, as much stuff as we do very, very intentionally. There's little things that like fall into our lap. Um, and when things do fall into our lap, since it is such a low percentage, we're very intentional about the fish we target. Um, it's got to be the day in the 22 foot sea pro that Blaine, myself and a guy named Jack Smith who works for us caught. Two billfish, one day. One's a surface billfish, a white marlin, and then a swordfish, daytime sword fishing all the way in 1,500 feet of water. And uh, yeah, the swordfish obviously didn't happen to our lap. You don't just like accidentally catch a swordfish in 1,800 or 1,500 feet of water. But the marlin was like fell into our laps really only because of Blaine is the only reason I caught that white marlin because we could have, uh, we kind of maybe slept a little further than we should have in the morning. We're just kind of like, it's been a slow trip. This sucks. I don't want to wake up. Blaine woke up, put two baits back. Sun's just coming up. White marlin comes up, eats our tuna bait that was not meant for marlin whatsoever. And a uh, little hardtail, baby. Hardtails for bait. <laughs> so it's neat when things fall into our lap because we do. We go to Massachusetts for bluefin. We do bluefin. We go to Massachusetts for striper. We do striper. We go out sword fishing, catch sword fishing. We go yellowfin tuna fishing, catch yellowfin tuna. We go look for big sharks. We catch big sharks. And so to have a white marlin, just like, wait, what? That's like, that's my neat stuff. <laughs> out of my control. <laughs> that was a good one. Okay. Blaine. Um, Probably most recently is when uh, we all we got three sailfish in the Sea Pro in oh, one day, yeah. and that's that's something that I really enjoyed because we had this game plan. We knew those fish were going to be there at this like time of year. For those of you who of y'all who don't know, is that in the bar in the like early fall, mid fall, there's a huge influx of sailfish that run quite literally less than a mile off the beach in the bar, Florida. So we knew this thing is, like happens every year. I jumped one off two years ago. So we set out our game plan, going to go just load up the live wells in the morning, make our way over to Navarre and just start bump trolling over the, the Navarre reefs there and ended up popping three sailfish in one day. And that, that was something that really, really satisfied us as anglers. It, it game plan panning out like that is was something really special. There's something to say about the Navarre Pier and the reefs there. And for all of us, obviously, for all the listeners, we get it. You're not here. But if you ever come here, all is sexy. It is. <laughs> it Navarre is, is it's yeah. good. Go ahead. No, I was just saying, Navarre is a special place. It's always been a special place. I think people are just figuring it out now. Mm -hmm. I mean, my first Mako, land-based Mako, came in Navarre. And lots of land-based Makos have come in Navarre. And you talk about you talk about pelagic species like, and shark, you know, Mako shark is a pelagic species. You talk about whites being landed there, Makos being landed there. Now you got sailfish, which is not a new thing either. Um, you got black fin tuna in the winter, which is not new. And they're not just any black fin tuna. They're one of the biggest black fin tuna you're going to find in the Gulf, 25 27 32 pounds so it's uh and it's not an accident these are things that people definitely like i'm sure you touched with spencer too because you gotta like think as an angler you don't just like happen on these things which is why the white marlin was my cool thing because we don't happen on the things most things are intentional navarre doesn't get all these really neat things and you're just like wow it must just be like the because it's called navarre and it starts with an n that's why no there's a reason there's a whole check the depths, check the contours, look at the Gulf Stream, look at the, you know, the edge 30 miles out. Where does that lead to? What is, what's funneling from Destin? There's a reason these things are happening. So yeah, it's, that's, that's what gets my gears going is the, the reasons why and how, and then finding them. Mm -hmm. And that's why the sailfish is so cool for Blaine too, because Blaine's caught a sailfish all the way in Boca. And we went to do it and we videoed it. And we talked about it on the way there, like yeah, talked about almost not going because we hadn't caught a sailfish here. And is that like a cheap cop out to go to Sailfish Alley and catch your first sailfish? So I think when Blaine got a sailfish in Boca, it was like neat, but not like not 100%. And then when he got to get a sailfish in Navarre at home in the Sea Pro, that was like, I ate my whole meal, dude. I'm full now. I'm full. Yeah. I got my sailfish. Yeah. And that's the neat thing about that, that trip, too. You guys have been doing, I, I never asked this, and it's not in the questions. 
you do a lot of fishing here. Do you guys do the Catch a Florida Memory program as well? No, we don't. We talked about it. Uh, me and you, you know, talked about it a couple of years ago, and it was just something that we got into, started it, and then like we haven't, and we need to. Because I Sorry. hear you reference it all the time, and I'm like, oh gosh, dang it, dude. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you do catch some of these life. Fit. I mean, you guys, the way you fish, the way you do stuff with the bow at the shore, all these pieces all throughout. I mean, you guys will hit that 50 lifetime list. Not it won't take you long. And then with your South Florida trips and all the other ones you guys do, I mean, you you guys, yeah, it'll be it'll be good. But that'd be that's a fun one. Yeah. Well, Navarre, yeah, I know we will see more people of it. And uh I kind of picking back on what you said there, but I wanted to add a piece. I think it's all like you said, it's always been here, but it's the angler mentality. Go up, don't tell anybody. You know, the knowledge doesn't want to get out there because, you know, people don't want to get crowded. But it's like, hey, guys, it's it's a big it's a big body of water. Not all of you are out there yeah. in axe boats and all that piece. Safety is par paramount. But you, you think the Florida Keys kept their mouth shut? Sure, they did until, you know, it wasn't able to be a secret anymore. It just happens. Yeah, no, exactly. Also, you're helping the I mean, there's twofold. And there's two sides to every story. And there's a pro and con to everything you do in life. But. There is a fishing economy that is surviving here on tourism. You live at the beach in a tourism town. So don't be surprised when tourists show up to tourist places and do tourist things. And they want to do cool local things in their tourist gap. Like it's that's the thought process sometimes that gets me. It's like, this is, hey, dude, if you don't like living in a tourist town and all this tourist stuff, don't live in a tourist place. You know, two hours up north, you won't find a single tourist in Evergreen, Alabama. I promise you. Nope. Now you can Less, go maybe a milk. tiny season, but <laughs> yeah, but yeah, you're right, man. I mean, that's there's no easier way to say that, and then people are going to get mad, like, oh, but I don't want to hear it. It's that's the I mean, way yeah, of the, the beast. It is what it is. This is how yeah. that's, this is how people survive. Exactly. Yeah, but I mean, I get I get the both sides, and you can't like can't discredit the other side too. I get it. It'd be frustrating if I didn't do this full time. I'd be like, hey, dude, don't tell people about my sailfish. <laughs> 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 but we do it full time and our goal is to help people. So I'm going to help people. And if you don't like it, you know, I don't know. Sorry. Sorry. Not sorry. Yeah. I help people. We help people catch fish. That's what we want to do, man. So, Well, it's been 20 minutes, everybody. You know what that means? It's time to check that bait and you should have checked it already. Make sure you're good to go because you know, you're not going to win by catching fish on credit. It just doesn't work like that. It's This bait check is being brought to you by DS Custom Tackle. DSCustomTackle.com is the website. Go on over there and take a look. As you can see, it is jam-packed full of gear. Yeah. If you need some stuff, yeah, I think you covered here. If you need rigs, look at this. There are so many in the shop. You need to get your hands on anything from drums. Look at that. Kings, pomps down here perch it's not just florida this has got you covered up and down the east coast and the west coast it doesn't matter where it is you're all set up there and if you're a rig maker and you're looking to get your hands on beads floats things of that nature hey look at that tons of beads right here and the floats is in another section there is a bunch the scullies get the scullies yeah dscustomtackle.com go take a look get your order in today great product great people and they're doing great things well, now that we've rocked through that one, let's get into the knowledge piece. Now, like we said, we're not going to go crazy with this one because you've answered some of these before. And I think with this one in Shark World and how you're doing boats and all these pieces with surf, we're going to tailor it into that one. So we'll, we'll kick it. it with you first, Dylan. And Blaine, right. by all means, you can jump in throughout. Please don't hesitate. Don't sit there quiet. Yeah, you're an important part uh -huh. of the show. So you guys do a lot of night fishing. That is... I see you a lot there and you're doing 12, 24 hour runs. What are some effective strategies for fishing at night and what safety precautions should anglers take during nighttime fishing? Um, yeah, I think the, the safety part at nighttime is the easiest one to touch on as quickly as possible. Um, you've got a twofold system there. Obviously lights are the most obviously obvious thing to say at night. You got to see what you're doing. You got to see whether you're rigging, whether you're dehooking a pompano, whether you're dehooking a shark, you got to be able to see where your hands are, what they're doing. Uh, but you also got the twofold part is you've got summertime turtle nesting things where you have to do so much light. Um, we are in a constant kind of battle with that. Um, and so, you know, we, we try to keep the lights on as less as possible.
But lighting is definitely an important one, um, and especially for our 6, 12, 24-hour trip where we're going all night long. We bring uh, multiple lithium batteries out with us on the beach. We rock a light bar at night because the whole camp needs to be completely spread. Um, and then, you know, fishing lights as far as like watching your rod tips or watching your lines. When we're shark fishing, it's a deep drop light. Um, you can find them on Amazon. You can find them here at Outcast Bait and Tackle in Pensacola. Um, but it's just a long line clip. It opens up. It clips onto your line. It more so pinches it. You can reel through it. No, it doesn't damage your line. And no, it will not slide down your line. Shark fishing at night is definitely important to see two things. Line going out, which is, you know, indicated by your clicker going off. But if the shark swims in, that light will drop down really slow. They're waterproof lights because they are for deep drop sword fishing, you know, thousands of feet deep. So they can go out into the water if they need to. Um, and you just pinch them, take them right back off. But surf fishing as well at night, if you're into that, uh, clip that, you know, glow sticks and stuff like that. There's a ton of products out there. You got to be able to see your rod tips. And I think if you're going to fish at night, the reason a lot of people don't fish at night is because they become ineffective because the gear list is like times, not, I would say times two. Maybe it's like 60% more than what you'd normally bring. Um, if you forget a few things in the checklist, let's just think off the top of our head, like bug spray. Now you're not having an enjoyable night. Now you're packing up after 30 minutes and you're losing your mind on the way up to the truck because mosquitoes are carrying you off. You don't have enough light. You're not having an enjoyable experience. You can't see your rod tip. You're missing bites. So basically don't be out there. So lighting and thinking through the little details before you get out there, um, definitely, definitely important. Blaine? Yeah, uh, you said not to be quiet, but Dylan pretty much just <laughs> explained everything that you need to know about night fishing. Well, there we go. That means you're getting the next one then. You're going to have to kick this off because, all right, so when I went backstory here, I, I've only been fishing with these guys once. They had an open, uh, God, we'll open call it show fish. and tell, yeah. open fishing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they had yeah. an open day and it was like, well, hell yeah, I want to go see how this is all about. It brought my daughter and it was really cool to see it all. And then I learned a ton about bait options for you guys. I didn't <laughs> realize that it was so specialized. I was like, what are you talking about? You got to use that. I'm like, yeah. Why? You know, it was really cool. And I was like, all right, this is fun. You know, kind of taking notes. So Blaine, kick us off here. What are some effective bait and lure choices? Yeah. Cause I know you like your lures. I know. you Yeah. Do. For uh, fishing oh. and what type of different lures or bait do you use to attract certain species? Um, as far as shark stuff goes, any fish bait is probably one of the best baits, whether typically the bloodier fish in like the tuna species, bonita, blackfin, yellowfin tuna heads, anything like that, that tends to be a really, really good clean bait. Um, and then on your opposite side of the spectrum, you've got your ray species, your cow nose, your southern rays, your butterfly rays. And those are all really solid options as well. It all comes down to sometimes time of year, even sometimes one night at a time. Sometimes they'll just be cued in on specifically Ray or they'll eat any piece of fish bait that's hitting the water. Um, and then lure wise, we, the majority of the time we deal with either topwater lures or slow sinking stick baits offshore for yellowfin tuna. Um, the poppers are, always one of our favorites and the floating stick baits just because you get that epic surface strike that just absolute blow your mind blow up um and that's really special but those sinking stick baits do have a benefit as well they get down you let it sink for a while until you get down to where you're maybe marking those two at 50 feet 75 foot they're not coming up to the surface you need to present a bait down there that can be effective and get them get them to bite your lure so we, we go through a plethora of lures offshore. We probably bring 20 to 25 different stick baits and poppers with us at a time just to kind of cover all the bases. Okay. So I, I've seen your topwater happiness uh, in several yeah. videos. It's like, man, you love them things. Is there a certain one or like you, that's my go-to. I want that brand, this size, that piece. Um, right now for me, as far as poppers go, um, there's a popper that unfortunately is only available overseas, um, in Australia. So you kind of have to do a little digging online for it, but it's the uh, FC, mm -hmm. it's the FCL EpiPop. Um, they have a lot of sizes and I, typically I'm dealing in the smaller ones in the 150 millimeter to the 190 millimeter size right now. And those are both you know, 55 grams and 75 grams, I believe. And those, 
don't have as much as the surface of the water here explosion off the top end it's more of a under the water bubble trail that i really like and i think it's really effective dylan uh i i just think it's funny that the fcl heavy pop is, is a sick lure it's been talked about for a really long time but blaine's backstory and history with this lure is one trip one popper one trip got a cut off on the boat and he's been like biting at the bit to get this popper back because it was like we were fishing the most hard hardest tuna bite you'll ever fish in your life is fishing for open water yellowfin tuna it's like chasing bonita in a kayak except for you're like these tuna are running like five miles away at a time but they're like 80 100 pounds and it's like you're running all day getting not not getting bit you're like fishing these things and blank got blew up on fcl but uh, i think it's important to note uh, the shark baits obviously blaine covered it it's perfect you got fish baits you got ray baits it's two things um it's, obviously there's a range of fish baits obviously there's a ray a range of um, ray baits that you can use and it's it's got to be a diversification it's the same thing you guys do for surf fishing that's that's fishing in its essence you have to like diversify your spread until you find what's working that specific day hour tide and then you stick to it um, but as far as the tuna stuff goes i think it's important to note that um, rapala is a sponsor of the channel and it's somebody we partnered with and anybody we partnered with for literally any reason whatsoever um, is because it's they're making products that we believe in and i have this this little flying fish popper it's called the rapala explode it's my favorite popper in the world. I caught my first ever yellowfin tuna on it. It's funny that we partnered with Rapala now because two years ago, Blaine, two, three, um, caught my first yellowfin tuna on topwater mm -hmm. popper, fishing open water tuna. Um, nuts, it was like 40, 50 pounds maybe, not that big of a tuna. I thought it was the craziest thing I was ever going to do the rest of my life. Um, and then fast forward to this year, we take Blaine's dad of all people out who was caught. He's caught like one solid yellowfin tuna chunking. And we were chasing these open water tuna. We, I mean, Blaine and I are like, just like the videos we watch on YouTube over in Aussie, hold on to the front, running down these fish, throwing baits. Looks like Mexico out here, giant tuna popping. We're doing all this stuff. And uh, Blaine's dad standing on the back, this 30 foot sportsman has my exact, same exact flying fish popper. Throws out the side of the boat with uh, you know, our nice tuna fishing popper set up. We were just like, oh, we're never gonna get bit, man. It sucks, it sucks, it sucks. And Mark's just throwing out the side of the boat. Most non-advantageous place to throw a popper, by the way, not off the front. He's throwing out the back of the boat and just gets freaking blew up on by a 60 pound tuna, same bait. And uh, so now we've got this whole like flying fish popper thing. And Blaine just got a yellowfin tuna on it when we went sword fishing for a little mm -hmm. grocery stop. And uh, same thing. So yeah, the little Rapala explodes, um, they're 135s or a solid size. Dude, that had to have been so cool. Oh man! Oh, yeah, Marky Mark, Mark Mark. My dad deserves on that one. You know, he he's gracious so enough to let us use the C Pro a lot. Obviously, we split a lot of costs with him as far as maintenance and stuff goes. But you know, he's he's not getting older per se, but it's it's getting to a point to where we we go pretty far in our little twenty two foot boat. So he doesn't get to go with us that often out that far. So when we hopped on our buddy Chris's boat, that 30 foot sportsman, and I, I gave him the invite, he was gung ho to go do it. And to see my dad catch that fish on that popper was pretty special. In no, front of um, our face, in front of our <laughs> face. Yeah, yeah. I don't, we caught no fish that day. No fish were caught by Don and Blaine. Sometimes the karma beast has to go another way. That's all. Yeah, yeah that's right, baby. That's experience. Blaine, and I love that. I mean, you were with you, you caught with your dad. I mean, that's huge, dude. That's so huge. Yeah, no, most definitely. That's uh, something that we've always had a pretty strong connection between us with was going and fishing, and for him to be able to ex start experiencing these big pelagic fish like me and Dylan have progressively done over the past couple of years is is really awesome. Perfect. Yeah. I've got that video on the channel. It's called Dream Fish on the Popper Offshore Pensacola, Florida. You should go watch it. It's two days. But best part was Blaine almost murdered himself gaffing that fish for his dad because he had – it was like one of those, like that tuna open water, they get close to the boat sometimes. They figure out what's going on, and didn't they take off, and it's a 45-minute fight. Blaine gaffed that fish in like maybe four or five minutes into the fight, and he had to reach really deep. And when you reach really deep, you get like gunnelled, which means like you rip your – like corpse into the side of the boat and Blaine <laughs> ate absolute crap to make sure his dad got that fish in, which is like, you could tell the pat there was like passion there. Like he would have done that for me for sure. He'd just been like, deal with it for 45 minutes. <laughs> but cause, cause Blaine loves his dad. No, I'm, just I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. 
But it's, it's definitely worth the watch because watching Blaine just rip his ribs into the side of the boat and then just like come out like the gaff should have gotten ripped out of his hands. It was it was like a true grit moment. It's pretty sick. Uh, way to go, Blaine. Way to go. <laughs> <laughs> what a son. What a son. <laughs> Oh, boy. And talking about those Australia lures, man, there's a few out of that country that just, it's like, can we please have some? Oh, yeah. I'd, I'd love it if you could ship me that. Yeah. Dude, the thing is, tough. the thing is, those lures are relatively inexpensive. It's the shipping that kills you every single time from Aussie. It's it's brutal. But a lot of those lures is what is what I'm going after right now because there's not a big U.S. market for custom wood lures and like poppers and stick baits and that's uh, and sometimes that's kind of what it takes to catch big elephant it's just lure presentation it, it can't just be you know this flashy epoxy thing it has to come down to the action of it yeah after having a conversation with uh actually out of massachusetts island x lures dude what when he started talking to me about stick baits and how pencil lures and all these pieces and presentation, it really, it really caused more gears because I mean, I, you guys have heard it. I've had a couple episodes with lure makers and every one of them has been a learning experience, but his, he, the way he broke down how to use with pencil lures and how that his stuff works, especially after stripers or, you know, tuna up there. Dude, it's a whole different game, and you just nail it. It's all about that presentation. You know, they're gonna see something, they're gonna go after it. If it's not what they want, they're not gonna touch it. They're like, "Yeah, cool story, bro," and then swim yeah. off. Absolutely, exactly right. And I'm not saying that at ICAST, I tried my best to bribe the dude to hook me up with a couple of those lures out of Australia. <laughs> I'm not gonna say that, but there's one color that uh, it's the glow in the dark tiger. I think it was. It's gray and white. I want that. I want that. <laughs> I want all of that. That's still on. Blaine's got a Blaine's got a good tip for finding Aussie lure. This dude's been like he hyper obsesses over lures, and he changes. His, Blaine found out that you can change your VPN or something to Aussie. Oh yeah, I, yeah, I changed yeah. my location on my Google thing and just looked up you know custom handmade lures, and I found uh, found a couple websites. Um, you get a different website, like more options. Than you would yeah searching from a u.s standpoint yeah um one Still website that's really shipping. good that's really consistent that i've been that i've been on is fishhead.com slash au um i found a lot of really good lures on there and I'm, I'm rocking a couple right now that i ordered off their website um and their their shipping is relatively inexpensive but the thing is about the website is i got freaked out the first time i got on there because everything on the website is in AU dollars Australia so, yeah oh. yeah so I was looking at like $150 lures and I didn't realize that it was in Australian dollars so definitely get your your currency calculator out and switch it over because they are relatively <laughs> inexpensive lures it's just the shipping that exchange rate man it's wonderful sometimes and it's a yep. horrible monster on others that's for sure yep absolutely all right let's kick into this one here and now this one uh blame Actually, Dylan, you got the last one, Blaine. Dylan, we'll kick to you on this one. What are the essential gear and tackle needs for a successful fishing trip on the shark side? Um, the boat is a monster, so but we'll stick on the shark one there. Yeah, um, sharks, fairly straightforward uh, for the most part. If you're wanting to do cast out stuff, um, you're going to need a rod that's obviously advantageous to throw the weight that you're going to be throwing, which are, whether it's, you know, depending on conditions, you throw a Sputnik weight, you throw a pyramid sinker, you've got four, five, six ounce weights. Um, and then you've got your bait weight. So you need to match your, you know, make your leader, make your mullet head, make your whiting head, whatever you're using first, um, and then figure out, match your rod to it. It needs to probably be 10, 11, 12 foot. I would just prefer to do 11, 12 foot. Um, and not, a lot of guys you've had, um, you know, Blake Brown talks about some of this stuff casting and he gets a lot more detail in it. If you're, if you're shark casting in my mind, you go get buy a pre-made leader. It's super fun. You spool up a six, eight thousand size reel, a sixty-five pound braid, ten, twelve foot rod. Whip out yourself a fresh bait. Fresh bait's gonna be king. Stop and go get mullet at you know some seafood market, and just wait. Just wait for a black tip. It's it's big time surf fishing. That literally it takes like less strategy than surf fishing. It'd be harder to catch pompano than it would be to catch a black tip. He comes through. He's gonna either eat it or he's not, and you move on, and then you play a numbers game. 
when you go up into the big shark fishing stuff, um, we're talking a little bit heavier stuff like responsibility, things that aren't maybe super fun when you're getting into it. It's like you you have this kid who's like, bro, we're going to Legoland. I'm gonna let you go crazy. Um, the kid gets to Legoland. He looks open. The whole sky's open. Everything he could ever dream of. And then mom and dad's like, look, but you can only spend $40. And you're like, how the crap am I going to spend $40 here? So what do you mean I have a responsibility when I'm targeting big sharks? And that's a conversation we probably finished for the next two hours. So I'll just try and wrap it up really quick. Shark fishing comes with a responsibility, obviously, that you have to take care of the fish that you're targeting. As soon as you buy a 50 wide reel, which is the minimum size reel you should buy, and you put 130 pound braid on it, you should be putting tight line braid on it, by the way, um, 130 pounds a minimum. You go 130, 150, 200, a 50 wide, 80 wide, 130, something like that. We won't get into the rods right now. But as soon as you say, I'm going to catch big sharks from the beach, you have signed yourself up for the responsibility of taking care of that fish. And I don't care if you've never done it. I don't care if it's the biggest tiger shark you've ever seen. I don't care if you're somewhat scared of that 12 foot hammer that you were handling. You said, I want to go catch big sharks. So you, as an individual, as a crew, as a person, have to take care of that shark you catch, whether you knew it was going to be a 12-foot hammer or not. So without getting too, obviously, doobie and gloomy into it, the necessary gear, um, if, you're, if you're running big baits and you think you might be catching big tiger sharks, stuff like that, 150-pound braid, 200-pound braid, top shot is a necessary thing as well. you got to put the stretch in there, match your top shot to the bottom size braid or go up. Blaine and I right now in our 130s, we're running 200-pound tight line braid. It's 15 to 1,800 yards, and it's a 250-pound model top shot. You get the 50 yards of top shot in your reel. You can absolutely lay the beans. Um, end game, anywhere, is the biggest thing. You're going to lose a fish. So at the end game of a shark, you want to be able to lay the beans to him, get him in quick. Um, and then the golden rule is if your fight is over 45 minutes, you probably killed that fish. And if it's a hammerhead and you fought it for over an hour, it's not even up for discussion that that fish is dead. Uh, now, tiger sharks, bull sharks, things like that can go longer than 45 minutes within unnecessary, you know, common range. But fight time is the biggest deal, and fight time trickles down to this. So you got to obviously the gear. So you got to put enough drag to them. 35, 40 pounds is a minimum. 40, 45, 50 pounds is more acceptable. 60 pounds, you come into a different safety range, which is your soul and your body from water skiing out to the water without a proper spotter. And that's complicated conversations. But if you're watching this podcast right now and you're thinking, I want to go catch big game sharks, please go check out the channel. We're going to work really hard to get some you know, other videos out there to explain this more in depth. But you can't just walk into that mall. Yeah, definitely, definitely start fishing with guys who know what they're doing. That's the best way to do it. But you got to take care of the fish and it's a responsibility thing. And I think the biggest thing is people jump in with two feet. They buy all the gear. Then they get the hammer on the end of the line. They don't even realize that what a strike setting is. They think it comes out of the box with whatever they, you know, Ava comes with 50 pounds at strike. So they think it comes out of the box, 50 pounds at strike. Next thing, another run 17 pounds at a hammerhead. And the thing that probably itches me the most is when people are like, bro, I caught this 10 foot hammer and I fought it for two and a half hours. Like it's something to brag about. And that tells you that the cue is just missed. And to be completely honest with you, it's not that guy's fault. It's my fault. I'm an influencer. I do this full time. We post videos. We reach enough people that if I'm not educating enough people, it's my fault. Because that guy doesn't know. But there's plenty of people out there to let him know. And so I failed, I failed you to not let you know. So this is one of those scenarios. I'm letting you know you get a responsibility to fish, quick fight times, proper gear. Um, and like I said, we can't go into all that detail now. But. It's not as fun as it sounds. It's fun once you get it down. But if, if you if you go out there and you start killing sharks, you're messing with my livelihood. You're messing with Florida shark fishing. You're messing with, you know, you're messing with my kids at some point. You know, my kids, I want my kids to do this someday. And uh, it comes with responsibility. So just be careful. Ask questions. Ask you, questions. You are actually, and I, I'm happy to give you this credit. <clears throat> you are the one that really brought it home a long time ago for me uh, when people were talking about shark fishing because I I'm not a shark angler. It's not my happiness. I, I know other people yeah. that is good power to you, but it was the, <laughs> feel that. if you're going to go out there, come down here on vacation and you set yourself up so light and fighting of those, you are doing a discredit to everything. And it was the be prepared, be prepared. If you're going to do this, yeah, you baby. have to do it the right way. 
And you drove drove that so hard into me for some reason. I yeah, I think you said it once. That's all it took was one. And then for me, anytime I've talked to anybody else on the shark world, especially on this podcast, has always been that one. I've always make sure I reiterate, you know, hey, if they don't say it, like, hey, make sure you got the right gear to get this done quickly. It's not about the the length. It's about getting it in and out and happy. Cool. Got my picture in, out, done. Okay, gills are in the water. You got the right one. You're following the right regulations. You're doing the right thing. All right, cool. More power to you. Exactly. Don't, yeah. don't be going out there doing stupid stuff because you're going to be that person that screws it for everybody. And yeah, yeah. Thank you guys for that because it's always stuck in my head as a you want to know about it. Here, here's a channel. Go talk to these guys and watch what they do. And I thought you did a podcast already. I thought you guys did an episode about that. Um, I think we touched on it a couple we times. We, That's tend, probably what it is. we tend to get off topic on our podcast, man. It's nuts. Playing and I just sit. We you end up sitting in like a truck ride where we just talk random crap. But no, nah, that's uh, the most important thing to take out of it is to realize that if you are brand new to shark fishing or you have been shark fishing for ten years and you do your whole livelihood is around shark fishing, FWC doesn't check your background when you kill a hammerhead. They don't care. You represent the sport just as much on day one as we do on year ten. So, um, and I don't mean that to say, I'm not trying to be like, don't shark fish, man. Like if you don't know, to be honest with you, most thing, if you want to shark fish, I love you. Go crazy. I'm going to help you every step of the way. We have Instagram. We have Facebook. My freaking number is on the website. Call my phone, text me, shoot us a message. We will help you. We are not, I think it would be a hypocritical thing to say, go out there, do it the right way, but I'm not going to help you guys. So any, literally anything, rigging, baits, weights, leaders, rods, connection, knots, it ask just freaking ask. That's it. You also bring up another good point, and we'll move on from this one. But uh, FWC, even if you're not in Florida, guys, yeah. ladies and gentlemen, go look at the FWC shark course. It is a well put together course. I mean, it's not going to take you forever. It's not the end all be all, but it's a great starter to start understanding sharks and how they, you know, what to do. Yeah, it gives you a real base knowledge for sure. Oh, Dylan. You know, I'm sorry, Blaine, you're just staring at me like, come on, let me play this one. All right, Blaine, this <laughs> one's going to be for you because I, I have a feeling you're going to be like, oh, because I know I, I remember when you started and it's been so fun watching your progression. You are just you're one of my favorite people to talk about. Like you want to see somebody that started and is now in the freaking World Series of Fishing. Yeah, go look at Blaine. This blank in you went what you didn't even go to triple A ball, dude. You just freaking got into the draft and just went right in. You got right on the freaking all star right out of high school. Yep. So here you go, Blaine. Let's start for you. What do you what do you do when you go fishing in a brand new place? Oh, um one research goes into it a whole lot, just understanding what kind of place we're going into. Um I mean, a very specific example was Alaska was extre was a very extremely difficult place to fish in general with how high their tidal swings are, what kind of terrain you're in, how cold the water is, what do you need to bring, that kind of things. And thankfully, you know, Spencer Wonder kind of headed up on that trip and did a lot of the background research, but me and Dylan also did ours ourselves and, you know, um, just making sure you're prepared for every scenario, put your research in, figure out what goes on in those areas, why they go on and bring the necessary gear. I mean, this weekend, even Cape San Blas, which is just three and a half hours away, we traveled there and there were things that we probably needed to know before we went into it. And we were slightly underprepared for, you know, the current situations we were fishing around a point where, the current just kind of whipped around the point and just started tearing down the beach. And unfortunately we didn't have a thick enough gauge weights. So some of the weights started slipping. So we were having to double up weights, things like that. It's just always being prepared for any sort of situation, especially when you're spending a couple hundred dollars to go to these places and fish really hard, fish really efficiently. You got to have the means to do it. That's smart, dude. I mean, research is key. It gets you through the whole one. You, you, you know, you plan to fail, or if it's it fail to plan, you plan to fail. Yeah, pretty yes. nice pieces there. Absolutely. All right, all right, guys. Well, the good news is you're done with that piece. We're gonna move in. I mean, I could <laughs> ask you the next two, but I really want to get into the guiding piece and a couple of the other ones here. So before yeah. we do that, let's do another bait check. It's been about 50 minutes, and you guys should have caught I a know. bunch of fish by now. Like it's it's just happens every time. And if you haven't moved, change your baits and move. 
get out of there, man. Go do something different on those zones. Here we go. This bait check is being brought to you by Kids Can Fish. Head on over to the website, kidscanfish.net, and take a look at all the great things that they're doing. Here you can see through the website, they've got all the information right here. They are a state and federally recognized 501c3 charitable foundation. All the camps and clinics all get funded back in to the organization to help these kids go out and go fish. If you also want information on the running of the Bulls tournament, it'll be updated right here up on top. And if you want to learn more about the entire team, you can take a look at the pro staff links. And learn all about Caroline, their partners, how to get in touch with them, and the photo gallery is always great. If you'd like to help them further, you can do one more. You can go over to Promar Ahi and take a look at that website, and you can buy into the CastNet. This is the specialized one. This is the one that you hear a lot about. Caroline has talked a lot about it, and a per a portion of the proceeds go back into Kids Can Fish. They have the three foot, the four foot, and the five foot. All these things are great, and it all again, it all goes back into the Kids Can Fish Foundation to help these kids continue to do great things with these camps. Keep your ears open because there's going to be a lot more things coming from them. It's always great and always great to be a part of it. All right, boys, so let's get into the guide world. Now, you guys are still crushing it. You're <laughs> still running charters. You're still going around. You're still doing all these things, and you're sending it out there, and people are coming home with so many great memories. Uh, the ones that I've seen, I don't think I've ever heard one bad thing. I think it's always smiles and you guys just nail it. So, uh, kick it off right here. Uh, Dylan, you can go ahead and lead it here. What got you guys into the guiding game? Oh gosh. Uh, my, my story getting into guiding is a little interesting. So I actually went to college for a four year degree in kinesiology, big sports guy, I played soccer all the way through college, played three, four sports in high school. Um, and like sports. Obviously, fishing was important, and it was a big part of my high school, but it was always like I was always surrounding myself with sports, um, playing soccer through college. I was just like, okay, I think this is, you know, I was doing the typical college kid thing. Like, this is what I want to do with my life at 19, which you don't know at 19. So I got my degree, worked at a gym in Mobile, Alabama, and I worked in sports performance specific training, worked there for exactly 365 days, felt empty, like personally, just not doing the right thing, not exactly what I was supposed to do. and. Uh, I got this like idea. A couple outside influencers that were seeing me shark fish. I'd been shark fishing all the way through college for five years at that point. And they were like, dude, you got this down. Like you could go guide. And I was just, I can remember the first couple of times I heard it. I was like, that would be awesome. Yeah, it'd be really cool. And that's like where it was like the conversation. And then at some point I was just so like unhappy with where my career was. I was like, all right, here's the deal. And and I made the, I remember the night I made the choice. It was like, the choice was this. It was, I'm going to quit my job. I'm going to guide full time or I'm going to live underneath a bridge, like literally burn everything that I possibly had sold, like moved to Orange Beach, like from Theodore, Alabama, like across the river and didn't even pick up a second job. And it was probably a really horrible decision. Um, hindsight and recommending to you guys to do that. Don't do that uh, phase into your transition. Uh, I think I made like $1,700 in 2019 total i almost i almost lived under the bridge i almost did the other side what i said yeah. but luckily 2020 it took off and uh we got we flew up crazy it was like 27 fish over 10 foot multiple the recommendations started flowing you know the trickle effect started but yeah uh, that was my my story don't don't follow my train tracks my friends it's a it's a bumpy train so all right, Blaine, I'm going to move the second one over to you. What sets shark fishing charters apart from other types of fishing charters and what kind of a uh, fishing experience do you aim to provide for the clients? Um, our main point is that the entire family can come, whether or not someone gets seasick, they don't want to get out in the boat. Mom's got to stay home with, you know, their three-year-old, four-year-old can't get on the boat with, you know, the dad and the brother or something like that. And, it's it's the whole family can come no matter the amount of people they can all come and enjoy the beach as well your foot your feet are on solid ground you're not rocking and rolling in a boat you're not crowded in the back of a cockpit of this small sporty or something like that and everybody can come enjoy it and then also it's we catch really big fish like not to toot our own horns or anything but the the fish that we catch are 
big and to a lot of people even if it's a four foot black tip that's the biggest thing that's the biggest living swimming thing that they've ever seen and it's absolutely epic to deliver that experience to someone like that and something that dylan drills a whole lot to the guys that work for us is it might be your 15th day in the row on the beach but it's that client's first night on the beach with you ever so working as hard as possible being as friendly to the clients as, as possible as well as it means everything to somebody and it also means everything to us as business owners and also we do a lot of the guiding trip guiding trips ourselves me and dylan work a lot on the beach still and just delivering that experience to someone else and providing that kind of service is, is something really special and you guys are crushing it dude i love it i love all the stuff you guys do Dylan, over to you for this one. What is your favorite part of running the charter business? Oh gosh, it's twofold, man. It's uh, it's crushing PBs. That's like that's the easiest one. Like everybody gets a PB almost every time, unless they're repeat clients. That like Blaine said, like whether it's six foot or it's ten foot, everyone's got a new PB almost every time they come out of the beach with us and catch a shark. Uh, but the second side is you get to share beach fishing and shark fishing and catching sharks. That that is a world that no one very few people get to experience. And so you are not only delivering a fishing experience, you're not only delivering a beach experience, you're not only delivering a guide experience, you're delivering the world of catch and release shark fishing. Um, and it comes with a huge line of education and throughout a night when clients show up, the questions they're asking in hour one and the questions they're asking in hour six are so sick because it's there you get this like, you're uh, someone with the six hour trip with us has developed more as a shark angler than someone probably could in six months by themselves. And it's just really neat. And these people don't even really care about fishing. They're not here to be, you know, for the most part, I'd say 20% of our clients actually want to come and learn about shark fishing. Uh, but yeah, everybody else is just like, you know, you book a snapper trip, you book a shark trip and that's what they do. And they can care less about some people have never even caught a fish before. And their first fish is a 12 foot tiger. Like, what is that? That's so weird. Uh you're you're ruined after that yeah i mean like what it's it's weird the 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 ability to cater to people at every literally every single skill level it's nuts sick Ugh. super sick stuff lucky to found i found you know it's, it's lucky that I, i'm not some genius i'm not i'm not spencer you know so i just happened into this thing and it was just like that's cool that's cool right 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 and then now you know fast forward to 2023 and it's like yes I can't believe this is possible, but yes, people can catch a thousand pound fish from the beach and have never turned a handle in their life. No. Uh, and you nailed like the next two questions of that answer. Well played. Well played indeed. <laughs> uh, Blaine, I'm kicking this one to you because I know you also share a big hand in this one. What advice or recommendations do you provide to the clients to prepare for this long shark uh, for a charter? I mean, the, like you guys said, you guys have got six, 12, you get 24s, you got all these pieces. And, and, but what do you recommend they do as far as gear and mindset? Um, gear wise, just coming in prepared, even in the summertime, you know, it's still 88 degrees at night, you know, middle of the night, but sometimes it, it can get kind of chilly out there on the beach. So, you know, a, a little sweatshirt or something, you know, probably a rain jacket just in case, you know, one of those midsummer thunderstorms pops up and, you know, if there's lightning in the area, the clients go up to the cars, we, we kind of sit with the rods, but snacks for the group, um, any sort of food or drink that they're going to want, you know, me and Dylan are big kind of, we, we got some ADHD in us. So sometimes waiting in between bites, we love to snack. We're always snacking on something. So, um, making sure that they bring, bring some snacks to kind of pass the time and then, you know, bring in a speaker, you know, most of the time we bring a speaker, listen to some music, kind of relax, hang out. Um, and then the FWC shark course, obviously they need to take that before they come out on the beach. Obviously you need to get a fishing permit because for whatever reason, Coast Guard doesn't allow us to provide those for our clients because we're not on a vessel. Um, and so that they'll need to acquire that as well. But, and then just come in with the mindset that anything can happen at any time. We see a lot of clients that come in and, you know, it's 1030 and they're already in, their hopes are already low that we're going to catch a shark. And me and Dylan are still, at, on, on the edge of our seats, you know, we're just waiting for that bite. And a, a lot of, a lot of clients get disheartened around that, you know, 10, 30, 11 o'clock mark. And 
we've told so many people that at it, literally any second that rod can go off. We've had it happen in the first minute of a trip starting and literally clients bags in their hands, walking back up to their cars, rod goes off and they reel on a fish of a lifetime. Dude, isn't that like the worst part too? You're like, Oh man, it's like, it's going to happen. Just patience. It's you're going to feel the adrenaline pour. I promise. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, that's fun right there. All right. Uh, over to you, Dylan, on this one. How do you cultivate positive relationships with clients and tailor the experience to the sp specific interest and goals for the trip? Yeah. So um, the, the first thing there comes into uh, like how you would, you know, research before you go to a travel trip. You got to talk to your clients. Um, that's something on the phone. We're booking a trip. I ask kind of like what you guys are wanting to get out of the experience. Now, you can get a good idea when it's like, hey, you know, me and my wife are coming down with the kids, we're looking to get them on a shark. You kind of already know the expectation. Um, or, you know, it's like, hey, me and my bros are coming down for a bachelor trip. Okay, I know the expectation. Like, you can you can gauge these things. But um, especially when someone calls and they're like, hey, I'm trying to get into shark fishing. I kind of want to book a trip with you guys. And it's like, okay, what are you trying to do? What's your experience? How how much do you want to get out of this? Especially when they come to. Um, I, ask the, I tell the guys, ask. Uh, you know, ask a lot of questions to your clients. Ask, you know, what the what the expectation is, and you can kind of you can kind of gauge um, what you need to deliver. Uh, for the most part, now it's an unspoken thing. It's pretty easy. You got some experience underneath your belt. You know exactly. Okay, these guys are just going to drink a bunch of beer, and if they catch one six foot shark, they're going to lose their freaking minds. And it you know it doesn't really matter. Uh, but they you know, and then for some like the shark fishing guys, they could care less if they're there to catch a shark. They're there to fish with us, and they're there to know. You know, you got to walk them through everything. This is where the zip tie goes. This is where the band goes. This is how we cut our bait. Um, and that's how you can deliver experience um, with somebody. You know, the biggest the biggest thing is that we teach our guys, you got to you have a six hours and you can't control fish. Unfortunately, demo of me and you can control fish. We may be making a lot more money, my friend. Stacked. Stacked. <laughs> <laughs> money bags, man. Money bags. So uh, you you can't control the fish, and you got to accept that as a guy. You have to accept you can't control the fish, especially sharks. We're we're stuck for in one spot for six hours. So you have to deliver an experience regardless of the sharks. Then when the sharks cooperate, that's a plus on top of the trip. Obviously, we wouldn't tell our clients that's you know expect no sharks at all. But the way you approach it as a guide is different as you approach it as a client. And so uh, we have to deliver experience, baby, every single night, regardless of what happens, whether it's a six foot shark, it's four foot shark, it's 12 foot shark. The experience has got to be the same every single night, the best you can. So tailoring to your clients is you got to you got to read the situation, read the room, baby. Good call right there. All right. What's the service area nowadays for the charters? <sighs> Perdido to Navarre. Simplest way. Three towns. Perdido Key. Uh, Pensacola and Navarre. We do go to Orange Beach. It's under specific situations. You have to have a private condo on the beach that isn't like, you know, if it's July and you want to go to the Phoenix East. Sorry, I'm not going to the Phoenix East in July. It's just not going to happen. But you have a private house in Orange Beach. Can't be in Gulf Shores. Fun fact, Gulf Shores doesn't allow any fishing whatsoever anymore. Apparently, if you're on the technical, we have to have a business license and stuff. So, but we can come to Orange Beach, but it's, you got to have a private beach access for us to go to because you can't shark fish in Orange Beach at public accesses anymore. Um, another oh, I fact. didn't know that changed. Yeah. I heard I heard it was possible. I didn't know it had actually changed. Yeah, yeah. As far as the business life, that's the thing. Like, hey, if you're a recreational guy, you pull up to an access, you shark fish, probably no one will say anything to you. But we have to have a business license for Orange Beach. And the only way we got that business license was here are the parameters. And that was talking to like the head of Alabama Conservation, Jason Downey. Uh, and he was like, here's the law. Like, All right, we'll follow it. All right, is what it is. Not a grease. But that's how, we, that's how we caught the white in Alabama. So. Dude, we had a private condo, baby. We had the access, and he 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 even put like I emailed him before we dropped the video. Because fun fact, we almost didn't drop the great white video. Almost didn't really? tell a single soul. I was I didn't know. Dude, there was like so Big John caught his great white, and he was getting like ripped all over the internet. Like people, he was literally getting death threats mailed to his house. People were finding his business address. Yeah, it was not oh, crap. Yeah, and so like I just didn't. I was like worried. I didn't want to like we're restarting a business in February. The coast worldwide started in February, and I didn't want to just like start off on like a, the worst note. So it's like one month into the business, we catch a great white, which is supposed to be the coolest thing ever. And then I, we had this like literally two weeks. We held on to the video, didn't even tell anybody. We caught it, and I was just like, I don't know. And then so I started doing the checklist, and we called. I called Sergeant Jason Downey. It was like, this is where we were. We followed the rules, and he was like, 
no freaking way. You got to post that. Like the, the head of conservation was like stamp of approval. And I was like, all right, if, if, if I can get it in writing, he was like, no, no, don't tell anybody. I said that. <laughs> but I was like, as long as, as long as no one's coming at my door. So. Oh, dude, that's so cool that he was like, yes, please. Hello, do it. Do it. Definitely. That's so good. I mean, hey, good job, man. You found the, you found what you needed to find to fall into the proper parameter. Nothing. Yeah, no death, that. no death threats. So that's good. That's, that is, Yes, that is very nuts. Good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, last one in this category, then we'll get into the social media world. What has been some very valuable lessons learned after starting and running this business? Oh, go ahead, Blaine. Go crazy. Oh, I love this. There was a pause. <laughs> Ooh, this is going to be fun. Uh, uh, there's so many lessons, dude. Oh, my gosh. I mean, for some of you guys watching, you guys know um, this isn't the first shark fishing business we've had. Um, so obviously when you have a second, when you come into a secondary business, there's lessons you learn. Um, and obviously there's people who didn't carry over over to this business. So without getting into detail of it, you just got to choose your partners carefully, man. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, we're playing it myself own coast worldwide in the legal sense. We both own it. Nobody, neither one of us is a hundred percent owner of this business. So Blaine and I are business partners. And, uh, basically at this point, there's a friendship. There's a business relationship and then there's a legal relationship that Blaine and I have. And you have to check all three of those. No, sorry. You have to check two of those. You don't have to be friends with your business partner. Probably best that you're not friends. And I'm working on that. I'm trying to push Blaine away so we don't have to hang out as much. <laughs> you're stuck but, together yeah. forever. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to leave, Demo. Help me. <laughs> yeah. Blink twice if you need something. I got you. If you need help. If you need help. <laughs> But you got to have the legal relationship and, and it doesn't matter if you're best friends with the person. Honestly, if you are best friends, it's an easier conversation to have. Protect me, protect yourself, protect the entity uh, and then have, you know, legal legal setup. That's the best advice I can give to somebody who's getting in the industry. Even even like if you're by yourself, I've seen the charter guys, shark fishing guys, which hey, if you're a charter shark fishing guy and you need some help, but brother, I want to help you out so I can help me out. So definitely reach out to me. But you got to protect yourself legally. It's nuts. There's dudes running charters right now in our area that don't have liability insurance. They don't have an LLC. They're not legally paying their taxes. They're not legally having their clients covered under insurance. They're, they have no waivers. I mean, dude, I can only imagine it's not going to be fun. It's fun to make side cash. It's fun to shark fish and the whole experience. I don't want, I just set yourself up for success, man. One kid gets shark rash on their leg and it gets infected they go to the hospital and you get a legal lawsuit it's like your house your truck your car they can't take your business because you didn't have one in the first place but like your life is going to be like changed bang yep. big deal big and freaking deal you so said that yourself, before man. you said that before um help blake hunter from 30a he said it there's so yeah. many charter guys there is a legitimate thing you have to do to start a business in the charter world it's not just a yeah hey, what the hell i'll just bring my card out there throw some rods uh, it'll be fine no there are legal things that need to be done and uncle sam all he wants is cut so yeah, yeah there's a lot to do shocking dude that scares the crap out of me my life is so very structured and intentional that like the more you do this, you figure things out, like not even just charter wise, like you figure out fishing industry things. And I'm just like, what? No insurance? What? <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna get yourself in trouble, man. The good old I like to live dangerously. Oh, apparently yeah, sweat. Yeah. let me know yeah. how I'll, let me know how you get all that money to be able to cover that because I want to be your friend. Yes, I do. Yeah, dude. Yeah. You got somebody backing you for the legal hundred thousand dollars, but Ooh. go crazy. Well, guys, you nailed this one. We're going to get into the final category here of uh, the content and YouTube. So before we do that, hey, you paycheck. guys have already caught them all. Paycheck! Paycheck! Let's go! <laughs> this paycheck is being brought to you by the Sinker Guy. Y'all know I love it. Let's go over to the SinkerGuy.com and take a look at everything that Chip's got going on in the Sinker Guy garage. Lots of fun stuff in this website, y'all. I mean, you can get lost in it, really. If you go take a look, you just uh, get right to the homepage here. It's got a little couple of things to talk about, but we go into the good stuff, get into the garage and into the shop. Need sinkers? It's in his name. It's got you covered there. The Bruno rig, the Uno rig, and the fishing mortician rig. We all love those. But if you need other supporting gear, he's got you covered with that. Bait, floats, oh, fishing line so many different things any kind of other supporting gear there's a lot on the website so again go over to the sinkerguy.com take a look 
Get your order in today. Extremely fast shipping, superb customer service, and Chip's going to make sure you're taken care of every time. That's just how he does it. Sinkerguy.com. Get your order in today. Well, I hope you all like the new format. Uh, this is the first time I've done a quote unquote commercials. So uh, I freaking yeah, love I, it. I have a face for radio and I'm okay with that. So <laughs> let's get into this one. Now, you guys have done phenomenal with your social media when you got everything launched back in with Coastal Worldwide. Things were growing, moving smooth, and it was just a, you made it look like a seamless transition and you guys handled it phenomenally. All of your content has grown so well to hit every facet of fishing that I, can totally see why people are so drawn because you really can feel that you for lack of better terms i get to use three of these in an episode you give a shit uh you're teaching people how to fish where to fish how to do it right but you're sharing the stoke you're sharing that motivation that dylan you have with your uh natural talent as you turn your camera off there we go as you know <laughs> you have that natural talent of you know being a professional speaker and a motivator so Congratulations on that one. You guys are doing phenomenal. Your podcast is a lot of fun to watch, and I've been enjoying it. And no, you don't go off on squirrel tangents that bad. <laughs> you know as well as I do how bad those can be. But you yeah, guys are yeah. doing it good. So let's go ahead and bring it into the beginning here. Share how you guys decided, all right, we're going to do this, and we're going to continue on with it. Oh, yeah. I mean, we had – I mean, Blaina had some time, baby. We had a whole year, 2022, to just kind of prepare what we were going to do, game plan a little bit. And uh, to be completely honest with you, we started on February 14th was the official, like, we're free day kind of thing. Let's launch everything. Let's get it going. And, uh, if you know, you shouldn't do things in life spitefully. That's, like, that's like the wrong way to approach it. Um, so I think the way Blaine and I approached the relaunch was not for anybody else but Blaine and myself. And when we relaunched it, it was one of these like, this business is going to be here for multiple, multiple decades. And one day we're going to show our kids these videos. One day we're going to show, you know, our family is going to watch these videos. So it's li quite literally our legacy is going to be left on the Internet. And that's how things are going to transition going forward. Like you're, you know, you've got your, your grandma has a picture book and she sits down and shows you the wedding. And it's like, that's, this is our legacy that we are leaving on the internet. And it was going to be the most intentional, like, like you've never seen before. Like we would go through the old stuff, watch it and just tear it apart. I mean, just like, that's crap. We didn't try hard enough. We should have done better. Like, this is the film. This is the new camera we're getting. Like research on cameras, research on mics, research on videography, like watching channels of YouTube guys who are like recording for Ford, Hyundai, like this stuff, like. It was, we came back like swinging, but like swinging to put our own stamp on it and, and to leave a legacy for ourselves. So it was, it was, I can say it's the most intentional thing that we've done on the social media side and it, it paid off tenfold, way better than we could have imagined. Blaine, anything to add that one? No, he, he, he hit it straight on. And luckily, um, you know, Dylan has learned tons and tons of things about the social media world now um that you know we weren't necessarily doing with on, on the previous side and i with as far as how our social media has grown so far i i can't take any credit in it at all except for my presence in the videos you know dylan edits everything face, make make sure that every post is posted on time posts are scheduled out that kind of thing and you know my my, my responsibility is in into the the charter side making sure everything over on that side's being kind of taken care of but as far as social media goes you know dylan takes care of just about every single piece of it and does an incredibly phenomenal job but see, Blaine, you're gonna make me cry. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I'm just kidding. Good moment, Blaine. I, 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 when I started talking about the whole piece, like going from you know drafted into the World Series for you, that's something I've always thought of with your journey that I've seen in social media. Is you know you came into this and you were somewhat green, but you were so motivated. You were just so motivated, and you were a sponge, man. You just absorbed and you have just grown into this friggin machine and it's been so fun watching your journey i mean dylan no offense i love you man you you've also got oh no, you're right you are right dude you're nailing seeing it. you start out that way and just have come so far uh like the one video that always sticks in my head now is the is the white 
was your faces and Dylan, you couldn't have caught a better glimpse on that with the camera. It's a white. It was like the greatest to me. That was the final bottom of the ninth bases loaded hit and you just crushed. So yeah. I, I appreciate it. I, I really do. You're doing good stuff, dude. Don't stop. Please. For the love of God, don't stop. Don't oh, stop. I, I, I won't. I don't want, oh, it's not even a choice anymore. It, 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 we no, have yeah. to, to, like our lives cannot go on if we don't do this. Yeah, that's right. So, Sorry, as I, I squirreled inside one there and gave you a little bit of extra blend. Love you to death, man. You're doing so many fun things. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, here we go into the next one. What role does digital media play into the approach of fishing, and how does it enhance your experience with connecting with the sport? Oh, gosh. The approach of fishing, is a that's like a fun one. I haven't really thought about like talking in depth of that. But um, easiest example, because I've got the video right in front of me. I'm exporting it right now. The sword fishing video is going to go live this week. Um, I guess it'll be a few weeks after it closes on, but the sword the, like for a sword fishing trip inside, cause we, I'm just working on it this morning, um, is like, you've got to get the gear prep. You've got to get the bait prep. You've got to find the locations. You got to look at your weather. You got to look at your altimetry. You got to look at your chlorophyll. So you do all these fishing things. And then you take three guys on a boat, on a 22 foot boat, where we're going to catch, you know, hopefully 150, 160 pound swordfish, which is what we got on this trip. And then you have this whole procedure of fishing in 1900 feet of water, sticking this fish, making sure he's plugged. You got to tease swordfish. So we tease them up, we free spool and tease them up until they choke the bait down and we stick them. So you've got, like, you think about all this like high above the waist kind of stuff that you're thinking about, um, high details to, to catch a high in fish. And then you've only got three people on the boat. So we don't have a cameraman right now. But hey, if you're out there watching right now, you like, you like filming full time, message me, man. Uh, cause we're looking for a camera guy, but that's, that's, that's not here or there, but also at the same time, when we stuck that swordfish, we got tight. We were making sure the first, the first bite we see is a GoPro. And then on this specific instance, I grabbed the camera and I was like, okay, you guys tease him. I'm going to film. And then we're watching the film. We stick him Now it's my swordfish because we had agreed, you know, it's like my turn to be on the rod. So now you can see as soon as we stick him, Blaine turns around and is like, give me the camera, give me the camera. So there's like, Blaine takes the camera. I get in the harness. Make sure the camera is right. Make sure the audio mics are on. And then there's less constant check the whole time of like, is the mics on? Has the SD card? Is the camera battery about to die? How's my mic? Is my mic good? Can you hear the audio in it? Um, is that GoPro good? And then when chaotic moments happen, like we bring up the leader and it's a bird's nest, 300 pound mono leader. And we're thinking we're going to have to hand line 80 feet of this last 150 pound swordfish. We tend to just like, you can easily put down everything and just figure out the thing, the tuna video. You can easily just like break off on that fish and then never, I'm not touching another camera again, but it's like, Hey, our audience wants a front row seat. This is kind of awkward. Everyone's pissed off, but like, let's go ahead and film real quick. Let's talk about this. So it's, it's, it's like another factor. If you have fishing as a factor, gear is a factor, water and food's a factor. Now you have camera gear and filming is a whole factor and doing that even this year, coming back very intentionally with like, we're going to get the best film possible. It's been one of those, we'll get back from a trip and be like, dude, we've got to step this crap up. Like we missed like two or three shots that really made or break this even being an episode. Like we've got a, got a fun fact this weekend, Cape San Blast update, playing caught a seven foot bull shark. No one hit record on the camera. There's a shark that we have zero film of. Oh, no. that's and it's today, man. Like that was like Ooh. two days ago. So we still do it. Like we, we still do it. Like, and it's, it's one of those things you've got to constantly like the crew and, and Jack's one of the guys who hangs out with us a lot. And he's just one of those guys that haven't been around a camera a lot. I've been around a camera a bunch and I, I should have checked the camera too. So it's a big factor. It matters. Yeah. I don't even getting the shot matters. That tuna video doesn't even really, it's not as cool if you don't get the blow up on the GoPro. I don't even know who turned the, I think it was Blaine. I didn't even like think about it. That's where you got to like, I walked up to throw and Blaine just happened to cut the GoPro on hindsight and we got the shot. Yeah. And, and then I, I would say touching on the purpose of our social media presence is obviously creating a legacy and memories for ourselves, but also in inspiration and teaching for this younger generation that's coming up behind us and taking over. Um, you know, unfortunately, in the world that we live in today, fishing is becoming more and more frowned upon with every day that goes on. So the more people that we get into it, the more people that we teach how to do it responsibly will keep our fisheries alive and will also keep fishing as a whole alive and just keep this constant rotation of these constant generations coming in and then in and then, you know, some falling out. But 
that's the main thing about now is all these fishing influencers are teaching all of these kids what to do, how to do it responsibly. And that's, that's everything. Yeah. It's also a reach thing real quick on that. Like the youth thing and like the influencer thing, you got to make sit, you got kid safe videos for the most part. Like, you mm -hmm. know, there's a handful of YouTube channels that are fishing guys that I wouldn't let my kids watch because it's mm. like, what are you, are you teaching our kids about fishing? Or are you teaching them like, what, uh, is this about fishing anymore? Or is this mm. about, you know, things that you can see with your eyes? <laughs> nope. I know exactly uh, where we're going with keep, this. Keep the attention there. So yeah, it's, it's important. Uh, kids say videos are important and that's what our yep. channel is too, for sure. Well, you guys are actually bringing you, you, you're segueing perfectly into the next one then. So can you walk us through the creative process? Like how do you plan, capture, edit, and share all of these experiences digitally? Um, yeah, as far as the YouTube long form videos go, um, just touching on it real quick is we, we plan our shoots for the most part when we're getting there. If it's a offshore trip or if it's a shark trip, you know, hey, we'll, we'll talk about the way there. Hey, this is how the intro is going to go. Um, we want to shoot the intro at Walmart before we get the groceries for this long weekend trip. Then we're going to do a walkthrough audio session, getting baits out. We kind of plan pre-plan a little bit, especially when I want somebody to shoot, because sometimes on the B-roll, I'm shooting more of it. Um, so we plan the shoots. Obviously, the fish are pretty straightforward. It's a lot of like in-time communication. Hey, Jack, grab the camera, play and make sure that GoPro is good. Is my mic good? Um, and then when I get home, the creative process is uh, detailed of sorts, but it's everything's off onto a hard drive um, and, and on a backup hard drive. So I back up both videos. Um, and then everything gets labeled, everything gets thrown into Adobe. Um, and then we start walking through the timeline, try to take our viewers through every little detail. We're trying to do longer form YouTube videos with more detailed information to where you can walk through the entire struggle and trip, uh, without just being like fish, 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 bye. Um, hopefully to help people. That's the idea. Yeah. Long form is a rough game, man. I mean, I'm in long form and I'm just like, hey, I get it. I'm asking for your time. But it's long form is so helpful because you, you you can chop it all into small pieces. But in reality, I'm going to give it to you in one big plate. You can come back to the buffet anytime you want to see it. Yeah, yeah the baby. shorts and reels, you'll miss some stuff. The, oh, the yeah. long form videos is where you get all of the information that we put out. Yeah, you can't. You can't do it in 60 seconds. You just you just can't. So you can do short tips, no. but. Uh, you've got to be careful if for YouTubers out there, man, if you're watching right now, you got to be very careful in the long form videos because you're gaining trust. If you're asking somebody for 30 minutes at a time when you post a 30 minute video, it's you could do it for, I feel like months and months. And then all of a sudden you drop one 30 minute video that's not that great. And you just kind of like got tired, didn't catch a lot of fish, but you needed a video and you need the views and maybe you need that Facebook or YouTube check. And then you drop some crap, you lose trust. If, you, if, if people will take their like little like free thing, the subscriber and views, and they will just rip it from you. If you don't, you got to gain their trust and then keep it, keep it for a long time. Yeah. yeah. I would say that the, the guy in the fishing industry right now that has gained that trust, especially like even for like, I think it's harder to gain fishermen's trust um, over mm -hmm. a long form video. And someone who has gained my trust and I know has gained Dylan's trust as well is Landshark. Land yeah. Sharks videos are absolutely phenomenal. My my attention is there throughout the entire video. He does great throwing little like tips and tricks here in, and then also just him as a person is a super interesting guy. It, even if he's not catching very many fish, his his commentary throughout the whole video is perfect. It, he is probably the industry standard right now as far as long form videos. Yes. Yeah, uh, yeah. When you see a land shark video, the the what you want to know about your channel, and and hopefully Vic sees this at some point, and Vic is the guy because when I see a Vic land shark video go up, I don't have to look at the title and thumbnail and go, ah, do I want? It's like boom, click, watch. I know he's gonna take care of me. He's gonna take care of my time. He's gonna deliver, and then it's done. And I just wait for the next one. When it pops up, I'm gonna if I have time, no hesitation, click. And every YouTuber out there should be gunning for that exact scenario everyone knows when demo posed the video baby bang i trust it i trust it let's go so and we're working on the same thing man thanks no man. matter you what guys, it delivers you guys are you guys are definitely doing the exact thing and you're right dude land shark is i, mean, I don't want to say he came out of nowhere but he came out with pure quality right off it was like damn dude way to set the bar yeah, yeah when he got <laughs> his film guy he got a film guy on board and, and I, I know vic's like 
has been good for that for a long time. But when he got his film guy, it, the video quality, it was already amazing. And it, when it went up 20%, production, yeah. production quality. It's sick to see, man. That's, that's what we're striving for. Yeah, I think you guys are real close. Real close. It's not there. Right there. All right, let's get these last ones so I can get you out because, hey, we're in super long form. We're at 100. We're at, 100. We're at an hour and 20 because that's 124. Um, let's, well, that's the last one in this one because I think this is one of the important questions and it's a good one to have because I think that it's an important thing for people. Do you guys uh, have a mentor? And if so, what has that done for you? Um, I've had, I've had definitely some mentors. I mean, you look back like, uh, you know, I had like my Papa John, like directed me in the, in the life choices of like going to the charter fishing direction. Um, I've had a lot of people, I'm one of those guys. It's kind of weird. I think people should adopt this same thing that I've adopted. It's not something of my own. Um, but older people, not even old people. Older people with more experience than you, who have seen more stuff in life than you, when Demo speaks and says something of advice, you listen to it. Now, granted, everything that everyone says you don't have to take, but you take these little chunks of advice and then you listen to them. And what I did was I listened to a lot of people over my life say, hey, I wish I had just gone for it when I was 20 years old. And I was 20 years old. So I just freaking went for it because I was like, you know what, the worst case. When I'm 27, I can go back and get another job if I really need to. But at least I can say I went for it because all these people seem to regret it. And I, you know, and I'll have those same advice people. But yeah, the, there's a lot of mentors and I can't think of like one specific person um, off the top of my head, but a lot of people just guiding in the right direction. And it's important to soak up that information and, and carry what matters to you. Good one. Blaine, what about you? You got with somebody that's like, yeah, you've had mentors or any other, anything to add on that? No, absolutely. You know, my my dad, a uh, huge part of my life. My love for him is absolutely unconditional, and I know it's the same for him for me. So, um, you know, that is that's always a super special thing. My mother as well. Um, but I, I think someone who's really helped me go through life, guide me through life, is as corny as it sounds, is Dylan. You know, um, I came into <laughs> met Dil met Dylan when I was you know, 17, 18 years old, you know, I no. don't know a whole lot about life in itself. And I moved out of my parents' house at 18 and moved into the house with Dylan. And from then on, you know, Dylan has ta it's taught me very valuable lessons. And we say it all the time. It's more not even friendship anymore. We're, we're family. So Dylan has been a huge mentor in my life and incredibly thankful for it. There you go, Dylan. Yeah, he said it on tape. Now it's locked. Yeah, that's right, baby. Now kids a sponge, man. It's it's been cool. It's nuts to think. Also, like fun fact, when it, Blaine started here, this podcast would never have happened because he he has grown into this like whole person. It's so sick to see Blaine's transition. But yeah, Blaine couldn't like get a whole sentence out to a camera ever. He's talking to his cell phone in his office right now. That's sick. That's sick because that kid could never do that at some point. That's cool. It's neat I'm stuff. Some, it's I'm cool. Some some old here. Do you remember? Tiger? You remember when Blaine was hunting for that twelve foot tiger? And oh my like, god! I'm gonna get it. I'm gonna get it. And it was like every time, dude. He was like, God, where's yeah. the tiger? That's yeah. a transition too, man. You could see Blaine grow over the years. We talked about that in the pot. We haven't dropped that podcast yet, but uh, yeah, there is a podcast we talked about. Blaine like used to get really, really, really upset about <laughs> missing fish and pulling hook. And it's just it's cool it's it's neat to see but, i i just remember and i'll remember that video that dropped when you did when you finally got it i'll be like yo thank you god yes yeah and it's like okay what's the next one buddy what, what's your yeah. next one you're gonna be yeah <laughs> um i just adjusted the questions here the closing questions we're only gonna do two so let me ask you another one in this category here the hard part in social media is getting content that relates to new people and experienced anglers. It's a freaking beast to go up that hill. How do you guys do that? There's a twofold way to, I, I think to do it in one exact way is in a short form video of sorts, which is the most challenging video of sorts. Um, but you got to show new, newer people just want to see the fish, especially with what we do, swordfish, yellowfin tuna, big sharks. They all sell themselves. Um, and then 
put detail and information about the specific fish. We were fishing at 1900 feet the other day for giant pelagic swordfish at the bottom using rig squid with 300 pound mono. And this fish fought for 45 minutes before we gaff in it next to the boat. The one mistake we made is we didn't put freaking gloves on. Now, as an experienced angler, you've gotten leader, 1900 feet, got to put your freaking gloves on. By the way, I got nasty hand. And then the, the new person watching is like, wow, 1900 feet, that's really deep. Whoa, 150 pound swordfish. Whoa, that thing looks really neat. And then they're entertained. They don't even probably hear 300 pound mono pre-rigged fishing eel squid j-hook like that little like stuff just goes right over the head but you can kind of like <laughs> pack all that little stuff into where if you know you know and you pick it up and if you don't you don't and that's fine fun that game great. though oh heads or tails baby <laughs> yeah <laughs> the gloves like yeah see i wouldn't even have thought of that till you said it not even a little yeah well oh, it's, it's important <laughs> So uh, well, this last one, and then we'll get into the closing questions here. What advice do you have for aspiring digital creators who want to blend their passion for this fishing world in creating this whole thing? Ooh. Uh, if I was if I was talking to somebody who's trying to start a brand YouTube channel tomorrow and they were at my house for two days to get a little mentorship about before they launched, I would say – the first video, do, you're always going to grow as a channel, but have a channel ID, have something that's somewhat different, um, not piggybacking off a lot of stuff because it will get saturated at some point. Um, but be freaking you, man. Like if Blaine did his YouTube channel all on his own, this man has to be a YouTube channel that shows his like, I try to highlight a lot. Blaine's a goofball, dude. He's goofy. He sings. He sings really freaking well. He'll never sing in front of people, but he sings really well. He belts out the most random like stuff at random times on the boat he makes funny jokes he is just a total so blaine had a, a, a if, if i knew blaine and he was like bro i'm gonna start a youtube channel I'd be like first thing you've got to get somebody you got to be uncomfortable you got to put your goofy side people need to see that because people will love you for it so you got to make yourself like a person and then obviously you got to go do something about it so blaine likes doing but you can't you can't fake it if you don't like bass fishing dude you can't go make a bass fishing channel Good luck. I'll see you in six months and you'll stop posting. That's what happens. Is people, people, you only run out of steam when you don't care about it. It's you can't shovel coal to fill yourself. It's self. Like, we run off hope and dream, baby. I'll never run out of that fuel. I will never run out of fuel. So find something that constantly fuels yourself and then genuinely do it. If you find yourself on camera being like, ah, that was great. Ah, yeah. And then you're like, camera cuts and you're like, freaking fish, dude. It's like, I don't know, you're, you're, again, see you in six months, you're going to quit. So, and I don't, there's no, I think it's the goofiest thing when people like YouTube channel, like compete. I think that's like, like as if you views can't like circulate through people. So that's like, I, I, same thing. I'll help anybody out, baby. But yeah, go out there and just be yourself. Can't fake it because you won't make it. Blaine, anything to add on that one? No, uh, perfect. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, Dylan out of the two of us is probably one of the more like motivational guys and tell you to kind of go for it. And I'll tell you the same things, but Dylan can put it into words like nobody else. It, it'll get you believing in something that you didn't already believe in before. It, it, it's, it's a gift. It's a gift. And you get goosebumps over there, Blaine. You get goosebumps. <laughs> Try to go film a video. You were hyping me up. You were hyping me up, and I hear you talk about it all the time. <laughs> Just, Dude, it's just because you that. were talking about your singing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I can absolutely see that being the way. Yeah, I can see that. Uh, Hands down. Guys, uh, you've been phenomenal here. Let's get into this last two. Uh, basically, the first one's most important, and then the, the next one is the hammer home. Where can listeners find more of your content, learn from your experiences, and stay up to date on all the adventures you guys are doing? Ooh, it's on the shirts, baby. Coastal Worldwide on literally completely everything. The only thing you got to do to find our website is you got to put a dash in between those two words, coastal-worldwide.com, because coastalworldwide.com was too expensive for us to buy. So everything else is Coastal Worldwide. Um, we started TikTok. Man, I, I have a hate relationship. With, I don't have a love-hate really. I have a hate relationship with TikTok. But Facebook, um, Instagram, and YouTube. And if I can be completely honest with you, if you like fishing and you like keeping up with our timeline, just stay off our Facebook. Facebook makes really good money when we repost things that go viral a lot. That's just the game we play. I put, I, I repost the same Dusky Shark de-hooking video. It gets a million views every time I post it. We make like $1,500 a month off that video itself. So if 
if you watch our Facebook and you go through it, it's going to be a goofy, like you can't follow anything. Instagram, if you want to follow a picture, a little shorts timeline, I don't repost anything. So you can go through our timeline, see exactly where we've been, what we're doing, where we're going. And then a uh, long form YouTube is like, if I could ask you to watch one thing, get home tonight, don't watch it on your cell phone at lunch, at work, put it on your TV with your dinner, like you're watching an op episode of The Office, which probably you should watch The Office over our YouTube videos because I freaking love The Office completely. But <laughs> definitely watch the long form videos on TV, put them on with dinner and, and be prepared to watch the whole thing. We'll deliver. You guys' the podcast went out to, you guys got the RSS feed on the podcast, too, aren't you on the podcast players now? Uh, it's just YouTube. We like to lazy put a podcast. Oh, I thought you guys were, I thought you guys went bigger on the, on the players. We, oh. we need to, we need to do like the whole thing. I probably have to like, t like do the, the, the mentor thing. I probably have to ask you where you, like, how you, <laughs> we just hit record and start talking bro. I'm telling you, it's pretty, it's pretty sketchy sometimes. <laughs> Not sketchy. But you'll learn some things. You'll definitely learn some things through our podcast. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. a it's a lot of it's a lot of uh it's a lot of rambling at times, which we tend to do. But uh even though we don't even know that we're spitting out useful information, you can definitely grab a lot from this podcast. Yeah, you get a bunch. Yeah. I don't know what you're talking about. It's a ton, and I've learned stuff and watching them like <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Oh, you'll learn the best not to, the best not to tie your shoes and the best way to catch a swordfish all in one podcast. It's so <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Perfect. All right, guys. Last question. Uh, Blaine, you've been stuck quiet for too long, so you're getting it first, and then Dylan, you can bring us home. Yeah. Blaine, what's next for you, buddy? Oof. Um, next is chasing chasing a tuna over 200 pounds on artificial. That's the that's the next bucket list check off right there. So uh, we've got a we've got a trip lined up for it um, early next year. So either we do it in our backyard here in the Gulf, um, in you know that uh, that lump season, you know March, February, that kind of time, um, and doing it on top water over closer to the Venice side of Louisiana, and or you know early next year into that uh, special destination that we've got lined up. <coughs> mm -hmm. Nice, good stuff. All right, Dylan, bring us home. What's next for you? All right, I think I think Blaine missed something. I I, I we've got one thing left. Oh God, I did miss it. You did I it. You missed it. it. I soiled it. <laughs> we got one thing left to do in this 22 foot steep road to close out the complete every single pelagic that is targetable in the Gulf of Mexico, and we've got to catch a blue marlin from this 22 foot single engine 225 2004 1500 hour boat. This death trap that we take out fishing 100 miles offshore. We've done blackfin, mahi, yellowfin, tuna, white marlin, sailfish, swordfish. What else, Blaine? What am I missing? African pompano. It's technically a pelagic. <clears throat> We've done it, but uh, it's it's blue marlin. It's the last one. It, it we don't count bluefin tuna because they're not like technically targetable in the Gulf of Mexico, and they're so like far out and like unreachable of sorts. And it's so random. We don't like, actually get a population. We just get breeders that roll through in January, but Blue Marlin's the last one, and I think we will close out a huge, like, chapter in oh, our yeah. books to catch every single targetable pelagic fish that swims in the Gulf of Mexico from a 22-foot freaking boat. Single. I think that'd be sick. I don't That's think it. people realize how <laughs> sketch but awesome, because we've talked about it on the other show on the Panadol Fishing Report, how much planning you guys do to take that 22-footer out. It's not just a whim, <laughs> hold my beer. No, you guys do a ton of planning for safety on there so before anybody's like, oh, you guys are crazy. there is a ton of things that go on beyond that so don't don't think they're just women it here yeah yeah i mean if we had a safer boat we'd probably take it but like hey we we ain't got it like that so do it do with what you got but it's yeah it's calculated risks for sure well, guys, you've been phenomenal. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I always love talking with you, and you guys have been a wealth of knowledge as always. And look forward to seeing the future content and all the good things you're going to do because I know it's going to continue. I appreciate it, baby. Thanks for Thank having you, us on, Demo. Demo. Oh, no problem, guys. All right, I will talk to you guys soon, that's for sure. Back Sounds to the good. green room. You too.
<laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, you've been listening to Finding Demo Surf Fishing Podcast, hanging out with Coastal Worldwide. So much good stuff came from this episode. I hope it helped you out on both the fishing and on the social media aspect, all the good stuff they do. If you want to go take a look at their stuff, Dylan already gave you the website, but you can go back to and you can find it on findingdemosurfishing.com. All these links will be back there on the episode and on the transistor page. Always good stuff. Always good having you here. And I'm so glad that you hung out. Uh, again, you've been listening to Finding Demo Surf Fishing. Been good seeing you. I'm out. <laughs>